that this Assembly acknowledges the ongoing climate and biodiversity emergency and calls by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for Rapid Decarbonisation, reiterates the Assembly's declaration of a climate and biodiversity emergency, the Assembly's demands for the urgent introduction of a Climate Change Act, the all-party new decade new approach commitment to delivering a Climate Change Act, and the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs commitment to a green growth strategy, recognises climate change as a human rights issue that risks deepening existing inequalities, further recognises the need for a stimulus-led just and green recovery to restart economic activity following the economic disruption arising from COVID-19, calls on the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to introduce a Climate Change Act with legally binding and ambitious sectoral emission reduction targets, and to ensure that any economic recovery strategy is underpinned by rapid decarbonisation and a just transition to protect jobs through upskilling people in carbon intensive sectors, and further calls on the Minister to introduce this Act in the Assembly within three months. And I call upon the Deputy Chair of the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, Mr Philip McGuigan, to move the motion. Good. Uh, moved. For this debate, uh, Mr. McGuigan will be allowed 10 minutes to propose, and uh, a member will be allowed 10 minutes to wind. One amendment has been selected and published on the Marshall list. Mr. McGuigan. Uh, last can call you. Uh, climate change has been identified as an immediate strategic priority in the New Decade New Approach deal. Over recent weeks and months, the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee has received a number of briefings which included matters relating to climate change. Speaking today as Deputy Chair of the Committee, I will now outline the work of the Committee in relation to this. In February 2020, the Committee took oral evidence from DERA on its proposals for the 2021 Budget. The Committee noted interest in the funding associated with the development of climate change legislation. Since then, the COVID crisis has had a significant impact on these plans. In June, the Committee scrutinised funding earmarked for climate change, but that was handed back in the June monitoring round. In terms of capital, the Committee raised concerns that one million earmarked for ICT to help support climate change plans was handed back. A further 0.5 million for the collaborative All Ireland Hub and Research and Development was also handed back. In addition to this, the Committee was informed that a further 1.6 million on the resource side earmarked for climate change was handed back too. Departmental officials indicated that while some work in relation to climate change is ongoing, progress is now less than originally planned. In written submissions to the Committee in response to the LCM on the Environment Bill, stakeholders raised concerns around climate change, such as the need for legislation. Members also discussed issues such as biodiversity with stakeholders as part of this work. In June, the Committee received a departmental briefing on DERA's draft business plan. The Committee heard that this plan is quite different from previous plans and there are a number of reasons for this, including the global pandemic, the fact that we are ex uh, approaching the end of the transition period following exit from the EU, the huge growth in public awareness on the environment, and the Minister's mm -hmm. wish to have sustainability at the heart of the Department's plans. The Committee heard that climate change was identified as a common theme in the development of key strategic priorities for the Department. Departmental officials highlighted the importance of this opportunity to help address many of the long-term environmental and climate change challenges that we face. The concept of green growth, as announced by the Minister in June, where sustainability is at the heart of our economic recovery, was welcomed by officials. They also outlined the cost and savings for the environment as a result of people working from home. In July, the Committee received a briefing on the draft NIEA and business plan. The Committee heard that NIEA will play a key role helping to deliver the DERA plan, including the green growth strategy. The committee discussed the links between the environment and the economy. NIEA officials indicated that they will work with Tourism NI and the Department for the Economy on this matter. The committee was also informed of prosperity agreements which promote greater resource efficiency, for example by companies changing their fuel to reduce carbon emissions. In an evidence session on July 1, the Minister provided more information on the Green Growth Strategy and plans to tackle environmental and climate change challenges. Recognising the importance of tackling climate change, the ERA Committee agreed to have a committee debate on the issue at its meeting on 1 July. A draft motion was considered by the committee and eight amendments were proposed. Of these, five were made and three were voted down. The wording of the motion, as we speak in today, was agreed on 2 July. 
The amendment calls for consultation. However, the Committee's position is that a Climate Change Act with legally binding and ambitious sectoral, sectoral emission reduction targets is needed and that a bill should be introduced within the next three months. And I hope the House can support this motion. And I now speak on behalf of Sinn Féin on the motion. Our demands, most moderate, are we only want the earth. So said James Connolly over 100 years ago. Those were modest demands, then and now, but I am sure he could never have imagined that 100 years on we would have to add saving the earth to his requests. Every week a different report or study alerts us to the real and catastrophic dangers of global warming. Yesterday we were told that polar bears would become extinct by the end of the century if more wasn't done to tackle climate change. Four days ago we were told that in a short time period from now, Millions of people around the world would be exposed to dangerous levels of heat stress, with many places experiencing summers too hot for humans to work in or even to live in. Last week, the World Meteorological Society predicted the possibility that over the next five years, global temperatures would likely break the 1.5 degrees increase threshold compared to pre-industrial temperature levels. We know that the target of keeping below 1.5 is vital to avoiding the worst climate impacts on our planet, and this was the figure agreed in 2015 at the Paris Climate Accord. And yet, despite the weekly warnings and dire consequences, here in the North, we still don't have a Climate Act or any legislation in place to ensure that we do our bit to fight back. This lack of urgency is, quite frankly, alarming. If we are to learn any lessons from the current health crisis, it is that swift and early action based on science is key. Perhaps there are still some climate deniers among us, those that think our contribution isn't needed, that it will cost us too much, that uh, maybe we could care less about the polar bears of the Arctic, as that's pretty far away from Ireland. Maybe are there are some who think that we won't have to face any of the cons sorry, consequences of climate change, or that we can live with the consequences we do face. I really hope we are beyond all those arguments. Global warming is a startling fact. It is not something that is going to happen, it is something that is happening. Ten of the warmest years on record have occurred since 2005, and the last decade just ended is the hottest ever. Global increase in temperatures means rising sea levels, affecting weather patterns that are causing increased flooding, droughts, storms, fires, and species dying across the globe. These aren't just happening in faraway places. On this island, over recent years, our farms, our towns, our communities and our infrastructure have all been severely impacted and damaged by storms, flooding and other forms of extreme weather, and our species' habitats have been affected too. All of this is set to continue. In fact, all of this is set to increase at the cost of much more damage here on this island and at the cost of many more lives elsewhere if we do not address the issue. Global warming is happening as a result of human behaviour. So we need to change human behaviour. That is the view of the majority of MLAs in this assembly, and it is supported by the majority of citizens living in the north, particularly among our young citizens. When the assembly was restored in January, the new decade, new approach gave new promise for immediate and far-reaching climate action that has been so absent from previous environment ministers. It promised commitments to a Green New Deal and a just transition away from an unequal society dependent on dirty, destructive and obsolete fossil fuels. But crucially, it promised a Climate Change Act, a piece of legislation to put in place world-leading carbon reduction targets to compel and guide decarbonisation and to hold ministers accountable to the Act in the face of the climate emergency. The new decade new approach was seven months ago. A month later, on the 3rd of February, in this chamber, in one of the first orders of business, MLAs endorsed and reinforced the sentiments of the NDNA and proclaimed a climate emergency and called for a just transition and a climate change act. That was over six months ago, and still we are waiting. When questioned about the lack of progress on the matter over the past seven months, the minister responsible has given answers that have given different variations of, we can't move too fast, I'm looking at it, I'm consulting, I've sought advice. We need more information. I'm committed to considering. I'm still considering, etc., etc. I hope it's clear when today's debate is over, Minister, that the time for considering and waiting has long since passed. In fact, the time for action has long since passed. We are embarrassingly the only region of these islands without climate change legislation. We need leadership and ambition now, Minister. When I tabled this motion, to the ERA committee, I did so to signal the urgency with which we in Sinn Féin view the climate emergency. 
The fact that we are debating the motion is because Sinn Féin and the majority of parties represented within the DEER committee feel the same urgency has been solely lacking from the Minister. We need legislation that puts us on a path to carbon neutrality by at least 2045. We need carbon budgets to guide us and hold us all accountable on this path. By doing so, we not only contribute to tackling climate breakdown, but we also unlock the vast economic potential of a just transition for a thriving green economy with high quality and well-paid employment by using our vast renewable energy resources that we have on this island and to lower costs for all of us, for warmer homes, for better transport, for cleaner air and healthier lives. For this reason, Sinn Féin has also repeatedly called for the establishment of a Just Transition Commission to bring together all the stakeholders in society to map out and agree on this future. Legislation must have substance and it must be based on science. We have 10 to 20 years to make a far-reaching impact. Most of us, I'm sure, got involved in politics to effect positive change. The most important change and legacy that politicians in this mandate can lead is one that helps to shape the future for our children and our grandchildren by taking positive steps to save and protect our environment and their future prosperity. Thank you, Mr McGuigan. We have nine uh, members wishing to contribute, plus, of course, the, the summation. I understand that there was a significant debate within the DERA committee on this issue, and therefore I would be intended to give priority to members of that committee, and that includes Mrs Claire Bailey. Uh, Claire, Ms Bailey, you will be called to speak uh, on this particular issue after the main parties have had a chance to, to contribute. Uh, I understand there is an amendment in the name of uh, Mrs Barton and Mr Stewart, and I would call upon Mrs Barton to move the amendment, and you have ten minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Temporary Speaker. I wish to move the amendment. I welcome this opportunity to reiterate support for a renewed commitment to deliver a Climate Change Act. With the recovery from COVID-19 and the introduction of the Green Growth Strategy, this is an ideal time for all departments within the government to take the opportunity through a consultation to work together to bring forward plans for a Climate Change Act. Climate change is nothing new. 50 million years ago, there was no ice at either the North or South Poles. 18,000 years ago, most of Britain was covered in ice and glaciers. The Earth's climate has seen many changes in its 4.5 billion years. Today, however, meteorologists, through data collected, suggest that the current changes are the result of increasing human populations, and activities that cause a build-up of man-made gases in the atmosphere that traps the sun heat, causing changes in weather patterns around the world. So it is this concern that we are addressing. The environment is something that we all value, and that has been particularly, ev and that has been particularly evident during the recent months when so many people long to get a walk in the countryside to escape the confines imposed by the COVID lockdown. A sustainable and affordable way forward must be explored in these most challenging times to curb and reduce our unnecessary emissions for the benefits of generations to come, to preserve, that, to preserve every environment that we enjoy so much. At no time has it been more important than for all the departments within the executive to support and work together in a combined effort to reduce emissions and move towards a zero carbon society for the benefits of our climate and biodiversity and ultimately our environment. While currently we have a mix of European, United Kingdom and Northern Ireland executive legislation governing greenhouse gas emissions, such as a Climate Change Act in England, which has set targets to cut emissions by 80% up to 2050, it is clear that Northern Ireland needs its own Climate Act through the Green Growth Strategy to work towards a number of Northern Ireland set targets. While we have broad national climate change legislation, Northern Ireland specific climate change concerns need to be addressed. 
That is why we need a consultation period to establish what best meets the requirements for our own Made in Northern Ireland legislation that will include its own unique local circumstances. The consultation should cover areas like what is good in other climate change acts, whether it's, UK climate, it's the UK climate change or others that we can put into our own act, along with identifying gaps and ensure there are, um, these are imposed into any new Northern Ireland legislation. This would allow the Northern Ireland Executive to undertake the appropriate degree of research and greater autonomy over planning for homegrown climate change initiatives, together with the setting of appropriate targets. For example, with the UK legislation and their action towards the 2050, means that reduction in emissions is both regularised and controlled ensuring that there is not an overly rapid response movement towards, for example, the scrappage of vehicles before their time, leading to expensive, more costly solutions that may be less expensive as time progresses towards 2050. A common strategic approach is a necessity on reducing emissions, but this must be informed by both data and consultation to enable the right decisions to be taken and the proper strategic approach to be implemented with evidence. Look at the situation at present where our grid cannot cope with the amount of wind energy that has been supplied. Yet our electricity prices are increasing as these producers have to receive a fair payment for their investment. No joined up strategic approach for this attempt at supporting green energy. The Northern Ireland DOE discussion paper from the 2015-16 is a good starting base to prepare the consultation. However, it was more of an overview, but we require more specific targets and a planned way forward that are backed by proper research and analysis to enable a way forward for our Northern Ireland Act. I appeal to stop knocking the agriculture and farming industry over climate change. There is a much bigger picture that needs to be considered with regard to making a difference to climate change issues. These are the issues that need detailed consideration in this consultation. I note that in Minister puts a statement in the House last month on the green growth approach and strategy. He said that he had set out a roadmap and would consult across the entire waste, agriculture, energy, environment, public and private sectors to get a well-rounded view as soon as possible. This is similar to what I believe should happen in the development of a Climate Change Act. There is some groundwork done with the 215 discussion paper. Now we need to put some details and specifics behind it. I don't want the consultation to act as a barrier to further progress. I want it to better inform the creation of legislation and produce an act that will serve the people of Northern Ireland for this and future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Barton. I now call upon Mr. William Irwin. Mr. Irwin. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this debate today? As a former, I am keenly interested in the protection of the environment. As I've said many times in this House, farmers play one of the most active roles in protecting and enhancing the environment through farming the land. It's also a fact that farmers are acutely impacted by climate change given the reliance on the land and vulnerability of, to more extreme weather events. At the outset of this debate, I feel this is a motion laden down with what is at present an unquantifiable level of commitment matched uh, with an unquantifiable associated cost. Those are two very important issues which must be measured if we are to realistically address concerns around climate change, whilst also ensuring we have a sustainable and profitable industries here in Northern Ireland. 
the current COVID-19 pandemic, uh, whilst taking a very harsh and regrettable toll on the health of the UK population and indeed on many other countries across the world, uh, has ta also taken a very harsh toll on the economic health of the United Kingdom. The predictions make for sobering reading and when the impacts of the pandemic are taken into account along with the changes in consumer habits over a period of months, there are justifiable and serious concerns over the length of time the economic recovery will likely take. I am interested to note a renowned firm, KPMG, believe that Northern Ireland will possibly be the most sheltered in this regard due to no small part to the strong food manufacturing base in Northern Ireland, which has continued to speed throughout the pandemic and again shows the importance of our agri-food sector in a, to our Northern Ireland economy. Indeed, agri-food accounts for in the region of 100,000 jobs and the, the food manufacturing sector accounts for 32% of manufacturing sales in Northern Ireland. This is an important industry and one that must be protected, especially in those most challenging and unprecedented times. Going forward, there is a new focus for this assembly and its associated departments. And that focus is and must continue to be the recovery of, of Northern Ireland, both its people and its, its economy, in line with the current health and scientific advice. With this recovery will come opportunities to do things differently and in line with the focus today on climate change and the environment, there are opportunities that should be taken uh, to make preparations and to allow Northern Ireland to continue on the right track. I have listened intently within the DR committee to our own minister, our department officials and industry representatives on the importance attached to the issue of effectively playing our part in addressing climate change. Indeed, I welcome Minister Pritch's very pragmatic, common sense approach to this issue, these issues. Uh, one only has to read his contributions to this chamber. Uh, to see that uh, he has a strong affiliation with the agri-food industry and, critically, an understanding of the environment. The green growth strategy is a case in point, and the opportunities for improvement in meeting our targets are many. It was enlightening at a recent committee meeting to learn that the era, as, the, as a department body, with hundreds of employees, has saved around 55,000 miles per day due to staff in, this new, in these new circumstances working from home. In an era, an era where carbon footprints are, concern, are a concern, that is a staggering amount of mileage. And when it is considered that over 35, the first 35 days of lockdown, this equates to 2 million miles saved. It is a very significant way of working. The positive impact on this on the environment is obvious. However, there is also a huge importance attached to ensuring that all elements of government continue to function as required to aid our recovery whilst pursuing new ways of working. This is only a single example, but it does show that it is possible within our own government structures. What is possible within our own government structures? I would make the argument that whilst those types of savings are more straightforward to make within the civil service, out in the world of industry, efficiencies are made as a matter of course simply to ensure that business remain operational and can survive. There is no money to waste out in the wider industry, and especially so at this most difficult time. That is why I believe that in green growth and many of the other actions and programmes that we may seek to roll out, the onus placed uh, on industry must be bearable, Could the member workable. bring these remarks to close, please? Correct. Pardon? Could you bring your remarks to close, please? Okay. If I can take, the, for instance, our dairy industry, which has worked extremely hard already in reducing its carbon intensity by 34 per cent between 1990 and 2017, that is a commendable achievement, and this must be recognised and built upon. Uh, the sustainability of our industry in Could Northern the Ireland please is vital. Finish, please. Uh, can I say that I do not support the motion, but will support the amendment? Thank you. I call Cara Hunter. Cara Hunter. Mr. Temporary Speaker, uh, and I'm delighted to speak on what is a very uh, important topic here today. Climate change is a real and unprecedented challenge for us all. We hold in our hands the responsibility for the future of the planet. The culture of how we view and care for our land must change. The SDLB will be supporting the motion before us today. 
and I welcome the fact the committee has brought it forward. Unfortunately, we will not be supporting the amendment because we, we, we feel, and we have no doubt, it is well-intentioned, but it removes the urgency of this motion. We can't wait any longer. We must act now. Climate change is the biggest threat we face, not only to the environment, but to our health, economic prosperity and global security. The overwhelming scientific consensus is that the impacts of climate change are accelerating and they are largely driven by greenhouse gas emissions as a result of human activity. If we are to combat the devastating environmental, health, economic and societal impact of climate change, we have a responsibility to act responsibly as individuals. From beach cleanups to climate strikes, we have seen the peace, positivity and passion shown by young people right across this island who have taught us that it is time to listen, to stand up and to be the change. We can no longer go on as business as usual. We must act now. Climate change is no longer a theory, but an irrefutable fact. Young people across the world are leading the fight for action and I stand with them. They will be here long after us and they have a real opportunity to do something no other generation has done in history, which is to leave the world in a better condition than which they got it. Having spoke with young activists directly, it is evident our education on environmentalism too must change to reflect the crisis that we are in, and climate education must be included more so in our curriculum. Given the right leadership and supported by the right legislation, we too can deliver change in a manner that will not just help address the environmental challenges, but also that has the potential to bring about significant economic and societal benefit for all. Climate breakdown is the seismic global challenge facing this generation. Failure to take action now will result in significant changes to our global climate and weather patterns that will devastate developed and developing economies right across the world, leaving millions destitute and poverty stricken. Global warming is happening and at a much faster rate than anticipated. Extraordinary action is required now to keep global temperature increases below 1.5 degrees Celsius and avert irreversible damage to our climate. Over the course of the last few years, millions of citizens right across Europe and across the world have called on governments and the political establishment to take action on the climate emergency for this generation and the next. The expressions of this crisis through protests in European capitals and school strikes on the streets across the north have their roots in social, economic, ecological and political upheaval. We know that this crisis will disproportionately affect those least able to bear the burden. Interventions designed to tackle the climate emergency must be robust, equitable, and contribute to social justice more broadly. We cannot create a society that offers tax cuts to the wealthy while introducing new levies that disproportionately target the poor. We cannot decarbonize our economy without ensuring that clean energy is more affordable. We cannot deliver income equality without a green economy that creates high quality jobs. We know that the ecological transition and economic equality must go hand in hand. Accepting and addressing the causes of the climate crisis is critical to, av to avoid irreversible damage to ecosystems and economies. The SDLP believes that protecting the environment is not an expensive political hobby horse. It is a moral, economic and health imperative that if planned and implemented correctly can benefit us all, people, communities and businesses. The future is in our hands. We owe it to our children and future generations, and we must act now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to call uh, Mr John Blair, and then following that, uh, Mrs Billy. Mr Blair. Thank you, Mr Temporary Speaker. I rise on behalf of the Alliance Party to support the need for a specific Climate Change Act for Northern Ireland, and I stress the urgency of this commitment, a commitment which was made in the New Decade New Approach Agreement six months ago. I therefore support the motion as brought by the committee. It is both the urgency, uh, temp Mr Temporary Speaker, and the importance of the issue and the required commitment that mean I am not in a position where I can support the amendment and neither can my colleagues. The amendment, for those of us in Alliance at least, falls short on detailing desired outcome and whether intentional or not dilutes the motion's intention of urgent action. The world, temporary speaker, is facing a climate emergency with potentially disastrous consequences. The impacts of climate change are already being felt by some of the most vulnerable regions in our world. Locally, we are experiencing changing and variable weather and climate patterns, increases in flooding, changes in the natural environment, habitats and biodiversity within these islands, 
and these will only increase in magnitude if action is not taken urgently to reduce carbon emissions. As the only region in the UK and Ireland without a specific net zero emissions target, and despite laudable attempts, we have not reduced our greenhouse gas emissions in line with scientific advice. Since the introduction of the UK Climate Change Act 2008, greenhouse gas emissions have fallen across the UK by 27 per cent, but in Northern Ireland only by 9 per cent. If we have not reduced the UK's net greenhouse gas emissions to zero by 2030, which is the position of the Alliance Party, we may not be able to play our full part in avoiding devastating tipping points that would shatter the global economy and pose existential human threats. This is the most critical decade, Mr Temporary Speaker. Northern Ireland is in urgent need of new policies that will protect the environment. We must embrace the challenge, legislate for ambitious net zero outcomes with interim targets, with sectoral targets, and invest also in zero carbon infrastructure and technologies. The Climate Change Act, already, as I've said, incredibly delayed, must deliver meaningful improvement that must implement mechanisms for ensuring that future environmental improvement uh, plans are sufficiently ambitious and are relevant specifically to Northern Ireland. I have today quite deliberately levelled no criticism directly at the Department. There have been, as we all know, competing demands, periods without devolution. There is remaining uncertainty about post-EU arrangements. It must be recognised as well, though, that the recent green growth strategy from the Department was a welcome step forward in environmental awareness and protection. The motion, I believe, is in the spirit of such protection, addressing our climate challenge and safeguarding our future. This is an inter interdepartmental issue requiring interdepartmental and cross-cutting solutions. I am pleased that the, commit the committee has brought the motion and pleased to support it. Well, thank you, Mr Blair, for such a succinct footing of your case, and also to Mrs Hunter and to Mrs Barton for a similar approach. I now call upon Claire Bailey. Thank you, Temporary Speaker. Um, and I'm very happy to support this motion, um, which my party and I believe is long overdue, and also thank my committee colleague, Mr McGuigan, for bringing it. Um, I'm very pleased to see the acknowledgement of climate change as a, a human rights issue within this motion. For many, climate change may seem like a distant possibility, something far into the future, but this misconception is very destructive. It's a falsehood, and it is our responsibility to face it head on. Communities in the global south are already experiencing the effects of climate change in the form of floods, droughts, hurricanes, and other extreme weather events. Climate change causes death and destruction, threatens peace and security, increases social inequality on a global scale, and it threatens economic stability and our way of life. Climate change exasperates chronic and contagious diseases, worsens food and water shortages, increases the risk of pandemics, and aggravates mass displacement. The UN forecast estimates that there could be anywhere between 25 million and 1 billion environmental migrants by 2050. Think about that. We see the social implications of climate change here in Northern Ireland. In agriculture, for example, more and more small farmers are unable to withstand the extreme weather events that we now see occurring year on year and forcing them to leave the land. If we look at projected levels of flooding by 2050, we know that we will be likely looking at a housing crisis of epic proportions, as much of Belfast, among other areas, will end up underwater. The reality of climate change is that those who are least responsible for causing the problem are those who will feel its effects most acutely and are least well equipped to respond to it. Climate change will not be a great leveller. It will not affect us all equally. And for all of our declarations of a climate breakdown, an ecological and biodiversity crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us what an emergency looks like and how to respond to it. Climate change, like COVID-19, requires a global to local response and long-term thinking, guided by science and the need to protect the most vulnerable. And it requires the political will to make that fundamental change on the way we live our lives in order to respond to what is an existential threat to humanity and all life on Earth. We need to start thinking about what a post-pandemic economy looks like. We all want to get back to normal, but normal isn't working. 
As Professor of Green Economy John Barry has said, the coronavirus has cancelled the future, but that's okay, it wasn't a very good one to begin with. We have a very unique chance here to change the course we are on for irreversible climate catastrophe and to build back better. We need to rebuild with a transformative Green New Deal. Our COVID recovery plan must decarbonise the economy in a way that tackles inequality and enhances the lives of ordinary people and our workers and our communities. The transition to a green economy must be underpinned by values of social justice and the principle that no one gets left behind. This legislation is long overdue. Both Scotland and Wales have their own legislation and both countries are set to meet and outperform their climate targets by 2020. In Northern Ireland, our emissions are not falling anywhere near the same rate. We've actually increased our share of the total UK emissions. The new decade new approach agreement included new commitments to introduce legislation and targets for reducing emissions in line with the Paris Agreement. However, um, we've seen little to no movement so far. We're already behind the rest of the UK. Work on this legislation needs to begin immediately. This legislation must be underpinned by ambitious, time-bound and legally binding sectoral targets. While there will be huge wins in the decarbonisation of the energy sector, th this must be accompanied by reductions in other sectors, such as transport and agriculture, in order to meet long-term emissions reductions. We need to front load these interim targets in order to ensure that we reach 80% reduction in emissions by 2030 and net zero by 2045 at least. We must also recognise that solutions will not always be technological. While innovation has a part to play, nature-based solutions are best placed to tackle both the climate and biodiversity crisis by restoring, protecting and managing carbon sinks and restoring... Could the member bring our remarks to a close, please? Certainly. The Climate Change Act is already well overdue, Mr Temporary Speaker. We're on the brink of disaster. The four degrees of temperature rise predicted will be catastrophic for Northern Ireland. We have been given a rare opportunity here. Let's not lose it. Thank you. Thank you. Could I call Dr Kiva Archibald? Dr Archibald. Margaret and Lesh Khan Corlia, um, and I rise to speak in support of the motion today and um, I won't be supporting the amendment. Back on the 3rd of February, this Assembly declared a climate emergency. We also call for the Executive to fulfil the climate action and, and environmental commitments agreed in New Decade, New Approach, and for the commencement as a matter of urgency, a review of the Executive's strategies to reduce carbon emissions in respect of the Paris Accord and the climate crisis. On the 17th of June, in response to my written question asking for an update, on the new decade, new approach to commitment to review the executive strategies to reduce carbon emissions, the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Minister said, I am still considering plans to meet climate change commitments and approaches outlined in new decade, new approach. I believe it is imperative that we build the evidence base and ensure government policy making has climate and environment at its core and that future policies and strategies can demonstrably deliver the outcomes people expect. The introduction of any new cross-cutting approaches on climate change will of course require the support of the NI executive. I think it's fair to say the evidence base clearly already exists. It has done for the past three decades. In fact, the evidence simply grows in terms of the scale of the disaster of not acting. Frankly, I don't really know what the outcomes that people expect means. Certainly the Paris Accord commits to limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees by the end of this century. And in NDNA in January, parties here committed to implementing policies to meet that target. And this assembly has declared a climate emergency and called for the implementation of those commitments. So I think it's fair to say people expect action that is going to achieve that and not simply rhetoric and can kicking. People expect a climate change act that with the type of binding sectoral targets and strategies to achieve them, that will meet our obligations in limiting global warming and preventing the catastrophic consequences of missing those targets. A few weeks ago, on the 1st of June, this Assembly called for a fair, just and green economic recovery that demonstrates that we value our key workers, protects the most vulnerable, protects workers' rights and our public services, and commits to tackling economic challenges by a just transition to a more high-skilled, regionally balanced and sustainable economy. Planning for the economic and societal recovery to COVID-19 that is also going to be able to deal with the challenges of the climate crisis now and into the future 
a, a recovery that is jobs-led, that is fair and just, would be hugely benefited by the introduction of a Climate Change Act with legally binding and ambitious sectoral targets. And to pick up on, on Mrs Barton's point, the, the reports are there, the, including the, climate change committee, or the Committee for Climate Change report from last year. The evidence is there, and there will, of course, be a consultation on any legislation that is being brought forward that will be shaped by best practice. Certainly, when I talk to stakeholders and delivery partners, including for business, energy, industry and academia, they are very keen to make progress on decarbonisation, but to some extent, they are working without a guide. They are planning loosely on the basis of the British targets that is not the localised and all-island approach that we need to protect our local economy and ensure a just transition for our citizens. It is... No, I have quite a lot to get through, sorry. It is vital that we have a genuine partnership approach which brings together representatives of all those who will be impacted, and in reality, who isn't. But here we mean representatives of workers, business, academia, and of course, agriculture and the agri-food industry, energy, the community and voluntary sector, and government to plan for the just transition and the economic recovery that will deliver jobs, prosperity, and a better quality of life and outcomes for people that can't simply be measured by GDP. Climate action must be based on social justice and must not disadvantage those who are least able to pay. That is why I have called for the setting up of a Just Transition Commission to plan for the decarbonisation of our economy and society. We need to see real investment in skills development and infrastructure and in the sectors that are going to deliver this. The green economy, the creative economy, the digital economy, research and innovation and academia. We have huge potential in this island and we should seek to build on that in a real joined up way through an all-island approach, because climate recognises no borders and the type of resilient and economy and society we want to create will be better enabled by supporting the development of secure local, global, uh, local supply chains. This is too crucial a time to dither and delay. The evidence for action is overwhelming and there is a real need for the regulatory framework through climate change legislation to ensure our strategies on building a better and fairer economy and society work for all citizens and protect and enhance the environment and planet for generations to come. Gurm I call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> the issues addressed within the motion affect us all. The environment around us, the economy within which we do business and the energy which we all consume. The experience of lockdown afforded many of us with the opportunity to enjoy creation and benefit from an altogether less polluted environment. Northern Ireland has an incredibly natural and diverse <laughs> environment. A recent research paper from academics of Queen's and Napier universities noted that there are some 308 different soil types across Northern Ireland, compared to around 700 for the whole of England and Wales. This statistic alone testifies to the wealth of our natural resources. <clears throat> I do not believe there is any benefit to be had from whipping up a frenzy of panic on climate change. Rather, we must approach these issues with positive action to ensure a cleaner environment and sustainable future for the years ahead. For such a goal to be achieved, it will require the collective will, not just of this House, but of society as a whole. I am glad that positive action has already been taken by my party colleagues in the executive to formulate a coordinated and strategic approach in tackling the challenge of climate change. It is incumbent upon us all that we take our responsibility seriously. It is worth reflecting on the achievements that have already been made in relation to tackling carbon emissions and waste outputs. For instance, 47% of our electricity mix already comes from renewable energy forms, and this is, a, this is a solid statistic on which to build. Yes, well. The, the member uh, talks about uh, the reduction. Uh, would he express disappointment, as I would, that in the north since 2008, our emissions have only reduced by 8 per cent, when uh, on the island of Britain they've fallen by 27 per cent? Members, next minute. Thank the member for his comment. <clears throat> I commend DERA for the work currently underway, particularly in relation to the green growth strategy within the delivery framework, the Forests for Our Future initiative, planting 18 million trees by 2030. 
In this sort of positive action that is required, similarly, the efforts to tackle plastic pollution through the deposit return scheme, thereby ensuring the plastic remains in the economy, will be of great benefit and quality to our environment. Prosperity agreements are already encouraging business to rethink how they do business, creating greener and more sustainable solutions. As the dear Minister has previously stated, sustainability must be our guiding light in all that we do. Sadly, COVID-19's effects are already being felt with job losses and economic uncertainty. We must ensure that our efforts around climate issues benefit people on the ground. Exciting opportunities lie ahead as we work to transform the economy from high to low carbon with the potential for sustainable job creation as a result. As we focus on emerging technologies, it is great to know that we can build on firm foundations such as our manufacturing sector as we look forward toward carbon alternatives such as hydrogen within the energy strategy. I certainly will. I appreciate the member giving way and note that he does. Others choose not to. That's their prerogative. Um, will he agree with me that in having a sustainable uh, way forward on this issue, that we shouldn't take the lead from the Republic of Ireland that have spent in excess of 100 million euros in buying credits to farm out their responsibilities to others while they continue to fail to meet uh, their international obligations, and that we are best placed to tackle this particular issue. And what we should not engage in is virtue signalling, which is what we hear from quite a number of members. We need real, tangible, sustainable ways forward to make sure we have a green and pleasant land in this country. Thank you, member, for his comments. <clears throat> Northern Ireland undoubtedly has the innovation skills and motivation across all sectors and industries to play a leading role in the development of green energy for benefit of not only our environment but also our economy for the future. The new energy strategy will likely set ambitious targets and actions for a fair and just transition to zero carbon society as we move toward the UK's 2050 commitment date. Mr Speaker, there is much to be done, but the work has already commenced. Sustainability will lead to economic growth and hopefully future prosperity for everyone. We must use the resources that we have been blessed with wisely. Thank you. I call Mark Durkin. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Climate change is one of the most serious threats that we face, not just to the environment, but to our health, our economic prosperity and our global security. The overwhelming scientific consensus, as has been said, is that the impacts of climate change are accelerating and that they are largely driven by greenhouse gas emissions as a result of human activity. If we are to combat the devastating environmental, health, economic and societal impact of climate change, we have a responsibility to act globally, locally and as individuals. Given the right leadership and supported by the right legislation, we can deliver change in a manner that will not just help address the environmental challenges, but also has the potential to bring about significant economic and societal benefit. That's not the first time I've said these words. In 2015, that's almost verbatim what I said when, as Environment Minister, I issued a discussion document that clearly set out the rationale for climate change legislation. At that time, there was a clear idea of how this legislation should look. It was our view that the Northern Ireland Climate Change Bill should do the following. It should make provisions for long, a long-term target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, make provisions for interim targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, place a duty to set limits on carbon budgets on the total amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted here, provide powers to request specified public bodies to report on their transition towards a low carbon economy and their plans to adapt to the effects of climate change. It should contain provisions to establish a Northern Ireland Committee on Climate Change or to designate an existing body to exercise advisory functions should it be decided that this was appropriate. Finally, our Climate Change Act must contain a requirement 
for Northern Ireland to obtain an independent assessment of progress made towards implementing the objectives, proposals and policies set out in the Northern Ireland Climate Change Adaptation Programme. This needed done as a matter of urgency five years ago. It needs done as a matter of emergency now. The vast majority of responses to that discussion document were positive, with people and groups recognising the need for us to act. Support was not unanimous, though, with reservations and, in some cases, outright opposition coming not unexpectedly from certain quarters in industry and agriculture. And the commercial concerns expressed have perennially been reflected in political opposition, or in the, today's case, resistance, to a climate change act from some quarters in this House. But that's OK. It's natural to have, and it's healthy to hear, different views. Some good work has been done uh, with industry, as Mr Hamilton said, through prosperity agreements as one vehicle to demonstrate the economic benefits and opportunities that going green can create. We have moved, or at least are moving, beyond the old world view that environmental regulation must constrain economic performance and productivity. It is possible to create a better environment and a stronger economy. Standing still will deliver neither, and we certainly stood still for three years here with no government, and it's time we got moving now. I was going to say that things here happen at a glacial pace, but thanks to global warming, the glaciers are probably moving quicker than we are now. Although, having said that, I must acknowledge Minister Putz's uh, green growth plans, the visionary work of Nicola Mallon as Minister for Infrastructure, and the great work that has been done by many of our councils, including Derry City and Strabane. The, uh, we, I won't be supporting the amendment. Uh, we believe it just kicks this can further down the road. The department have, I believe, enough work done on this to know what needs done. And as a bill makes its way through a robust legislative process, there will be ample opportunity for engagement, evidence gathering, amendments and improvement. Commitment to advancing this legislation as a cornerstone of the new decade, new approach I agreement. Can I ask the member remarks to close? An agreement which has brought us all back here. Let's honour that commitment. We need an act, and we need to act. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, in my maiden speech in this chamber, I fully supported the Assembly's declaration of a climate emergency and that of the climate commitments made in the new decade, new approach document, and that they should be acted upon as the bare minimum. In some respects, everything has changed six months later as a result of COVID-19. The need for us to act urgently in response to the climate emergency has not, however, changed one bit. I fully support the motion uh, tabled today, including the timetable for the Minister to introduce a Climate Change Act. I will focus my comments today as my, in my role as the Alliance Party's Finance and Infrastructure Spokesperson, and at this point I should declare that I was previously an employee of TransLink and a councillor in Ards and North Down Borough Council. Rapid decarbonisation, green growth and a green recovery will not happen unless we significantly invest, increase our investment in the relevant infrastructure. Having a fit-for-purpose planning system, which enables plans to proceed, such as the north-south interconnector and wind farms stuck in the planning system waiting for approval for years, is of real importance to enable more uh, renewable electricity to flow into our grid. Investing in our broadband network, particularly in rural areas, is essential to enable more people to work remotely and to avoid lengthy commutes. Bringing forward a scheme to incentivise home insulation, as the Chancellor announced for England and Wales two weeks ago, could play a significant role in reducing household energy consumption. These are just a few steps that we can take immediately to deliver the green infrastructure and investment we need. But first, we must better utilise our own existing borrowing powers. This year, we have not drawn down a penny of the available borrowing from the National Loans Fund and have handed back millions of pounds in financial transactions capital. This is inexcusable, Mr Deputy Speaker, at a time when we should be investing in our future and only serves to make the case for a National Infrastructure Commission even stronger. 
This body could advise the Executive on and oversee delivery of a green infrastructure strategy, identifying the projects best suited to delivering green growth and those both shovel-worthy as well as shovel-ready. The second aspect of our response to the climate emergency I want to touch upon today is how we travel. Transport accounts for 20 per cent of our CO2 emissions in Northern Ireland and will be key to achieving any future targets set out in a Climate Change Act if it is ever brought before this place. Transing's current financial predicament as a result of the slump in passenger numbers is no reason to give up on public transport. We should instead be seeking to build back better, rivaling other parts of Europe in their investment in sustainable transport, rather than continuing the chronic underinvestment which has bedeviled Northern Ireland for years. The new government in the South has committed to invest in a new public transport of a ratio of two to one to new roads. We must adopt something similar in our response to the climate emergency in Northern Ireland. We have the tools right here in Northern Ireland to make our public transport system as green as anywhere in the world. Right Bus is already delivering cutting edge hydrogen and electric buses, which with the right support could be as cheap as the fossil fuel counterparts in the very near future. By working with firms such as Right Bus, we can tackle the climate emergency, ensure better air quality and support economic recovery all at the same time. As well as investing in public transport, we must also rapidly increase our commitment to active travel. Increased provision for pedestrians and cyclists brought in during COVID-19 should be made permanent, but it also should be built upon to catalyse a shift in how we travel. In closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, I fully endorse the motion and the onus it places upon the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to act quickly. But responding to climate emergency is the obligation of every minister and every member of this House. Financing green infrastructure investment and decarbonising how we travel must be essentially components of our collective response. Thank you. And I call Matthew Toole, and you will have the remaining three minutes of this debate. Thank you, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I will um, try and be concise. Um, uh, I'd echo the sentiments of um, uh, my colleague, uh, Cara Hunter, and indeed my colleague, Mark Dirk, and indeed um, many others who have supported this motion. Um, a few weeks ago in the Assembly, the Minister for Agriculture set, set out his vision for a green growth strategy. The Minister told us that the data and evidence for carbon emissions uh, increasing is irrefutable, and that Northern Ireland needs to do much more to meet the UK government's target of reaching net zero carbon by 2050. Who could refute that data? And indeed, just to go back to some of the points that have been made in terms of um, the member um, for uh, Strangford said that, um, th that Northern Ireland had done well. Well, just to, to put it in context, Philip McGuigan gave a little bit of the context since 2008. But between, 2000, between 1990 and 2017, in relation to other parts of the UK, Northern Ireland emissions fell by 18%. In comparison with that, Wales fell by 25%. England fell by 45%. Scotland fell by 48%. Um, uh, Paul Given was drawing contrasts with um, the Republic of Ireland. Well, it may be the case that the Republic of Ireland need to be more ambitious in terms of their climate uh, reduction targets, but they're doing that, as others have said, um, and they've got an ambitious series of targets in the programme for government. So I welcome the um, sentiments expressed by the Minister a few weeks ago. We do have much more work to do, and that work needs to start right now. Um, they were strongly backed up by uh, the Committee on Climate Change uh, Progress Report to the UK Parliament, which said that devolved administrations need to step up to the plate. Um, we know this legislation, proposed legislation, was specifically mentioned within the New Decade New Approach document. We need to step up to the plate. That's right. The Assembly has recognised the gravity of the climate uh, emergency in one of our first sittings back earlier this year. We passed uh, a motion uh, describing uh, the situation as a climate emergency. That puts an onus on us to deliver this legislation. It's critical that we now move from those declarations to a specific action, to the specific action of delivering a climate change act. Um, uh, the impact of having no binding climate change legislation in Northern Ireland is already apparent. There is considerable disparity in emissions reductions progress between Northern Ireland and other parts of the UK, as I have said. Um, legally binding targets will move us beyond the current status quo of vague aspirations with minimal practical implementation and towards um, uh, serious uh, long-term and interim targets. We are, as I've said, one of the worst performing, uh, the worst performing UK region uh, in terms of reductions. We simply can't wait any longer. I'm coming to the end of my three minutes. So simply, I would say in closing to 
uh, keep my remarks brief, that we have been a backwater in terms of climate action for far too long. And if we can crash out, if six months is a, close enough de is a short enough deadline to crash out of the EU without um, preparing our businesses for it, then I'm afraid three months is more than long enough for the Minister to uh, bring Remember forth climate change up. legislation. We do, as my colleagues have said, support this motion. Uh, we don't support the amendment because I'm afraid the we've waited long enough is for specific legislation. So I commend this motion and uh, colleagues who have brought it to the House. I now call on the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, Evan Putz, to respond to the debate. Well, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. appreciate the opportunity to respond. A three month time frame is impossible to achieve. It is ridiculous to ask for it. The member who has just spoken says it is adequate time, yet his party had five years in this office to bring forward a Climate Change Act and did not do it, and they want me to do something in three months. It is just quite ridiculous, uh, Mr O'Toole. Northern Ireland has reduced its carbon footprint um, since 1990 by 20 per cent. And do we believe more needs to be done? Of course, more needs to be done. Transport, energy, agriculture are the big players, accounting for some 65 per cent of greenhouse gases. So what are we going to do? Are we going to pass motions which basically replicate what others have done and haven't successfully challenged the greenhouse gas problem? Are we going to take actions? Because I'm not a politician who gets too hung up about motions and about regulations and all of that. I want to see actions and things which will make tangible differences here in Northern Ireland and beyond. When I was previously minister, I will give away yes. I thank the Minister for giving way and agree with him. Motions are important, but action is essential. He may or may not be aware, but there is currently an application on the uh, Economies Minister desk around allowing for extraction of petroleum across the north. Would he agree with me that rejecting that application would put those actions uh, in the words? Well, that is uh, entirely a matter for the people who lo are looking at that. I, I would say that importing gas from Russia or importing oil and from the Middle East does not strike me as necessarily being more environmentally friendly. Um, than doing it here, uh, but nonetheless, it is for people I have no idea whatsoever um, in respect of this application uh, and won't comment on it um, because it may well come across my desk with factual information uh, which I, I, I can analyse then. But we do need to do more when it comes to these issues. And the last time whenever I was Environment Minister, it was brought to me about recycling, about waste, and at that point, our recycling rate was around 25 per cent, the low 20s actually. And they said, well, we could aim for a target of 40 per cent by 2020. And I said, no, we're not doing that. We're going for 50. It won't be achieved. It was achieved. Whenever I became minister, we were getting nowhere on renewable energy because of the planning legislation that existed. So we brought in the appropriate planning legislation and as a consequence of that, Northern Ireland is now producing over 40 per cent of its energy from renewable sources. Now, Mrs Barton quite lightly raised the issue of the utilisation of it, and there's a course of work needs to be done in doing that. But nonetheless, we believe in actions, not words. And what I hear from a lot of the members that have come forward here today is words. They want me to do something in three months, having delayed uh, this assembly actually doing anything for three years. So I want to see ensure that we do get those actions. And in terms of it, um, I think your, your colleague will have an opportunity to, to, to speak later, and, and you had 10 minutes. Uh, in terms of it, Lord Debon um, produced a report uh, for Westminster, and he sets out a series of actions. He's looking at investments in low carbon and climate resilient infrastructure. Supporting reskilling, retraining, innovation, and research for a net zero, well adapted economy. Upgrades to our homes and building new homes, ensuring they are fit for the future. Making it easy for people to walk, cycle, and work remotely. And tree planting, peatland restoration, um, green spaces, and other green infrastructure. That does not just cut across my department, that cuts across all departments. I want to know 
what the colleagues, the ministerial colleagues of the individuals who have been speaking in this debate are doing in their departments. Because this is not, a, not an issue which is solely for DERA. Every department has a role. Every department has a responsibility. Already in DERA, in spite of COVID, in spite of all of the problems and the delays and distractions as a consequence in the first six months, we have been able to bring forward our Forest for the Future strategy. We have been able to bring forward our Green Growth strategy. And I can tell you, we are working on programs which will make real and significant change. And I have members of my staff working extremely hard on developing ideas which will drive real reductions in greenhouse gases in my department and I, I, I trust elsewhere. We'll see how time goes. And you will not find this minister wanting when it comes to dealing with this, these issues. And we will see who steps up to the plate. We will see what other ministers will do in support of what I want to achieve when it comes to environmental issues, because it will be extremely challenging. I am not going to be going forward with some very limited proposal. I want to see a programme which will deliver real, tangible changes uh, when it comes to the environment. I do have to say the quality of scientific work has been challenged on the back of COVID-19. So we have been told for years that cows, for example, make a dreadful contribution uh, when it comes to greenhouse gases. Interestingly enough, during the COVID period, the number of cows didn't go down, but the greenhouse gases certainly did. And subsequent to that, we now have other scientists who are indicating that the methane produced by cows has had relatively little impact on the environment. So, in terms of this, we need qualitative science. And I'm thankful that we have um, organisations like AFPE that exist in Northern Ireland. But we need qualitative science to demonstrate to us, in a very unequivocal way, what the real contribution of agriculture is. Because it's very easy to say that a cow produces so much methane. But none of them have been coming forward to say what a cow does in terms of sequestration of carbon. Um, because she eats that lovely green grass. And that green grass has roots which goes down into the soil. And that green grass captures carbon. And it takes that carbon down into the soil. And the cow actually tramples grass down into the soil along with it particularly those cows which are grazed in extensive systems that we have in Northern Ireland. And I'm conscious that Sinn Féin want me to bring forward motions, or are bringing forward motions, which would introduce legislation in a rush way, which would inevitably damage farming and make hill farming unsustainable in Northern Ireland. And I've heard Mr McAleer, and, and, and they're talking out of both sides of their mouths, because Mr McAleer is constantly um, protesting for hill farmers. Mr McGuigan is constantly protesting on something which would damage hill farmers. So we need to be very clear about it. We need to be very clear about it. The legislation that has been brought in in other places would be damaging to Northern Ireland's agriculture and consequently damaging uh, to the hill farmers that Mr McAleer uh, likes to talk about a lot. And I'll not be, I'll not be having it. It will not be on my watch that we will be damaging uh, the people who are trying to make a living on the hills, because those people are making a positive contribution. And I want to ensure that we have the scientific evidence to demonstrate that they are making a positive contribution. Carbon capture exists in our trees, in our hedges, in our grasslands. And the sequestration that takes place is significant. And we need that science uh, to back us up and to demonstrate uh, that we are doing uh, some things that are for real and for which are truly beneficial. 
Mr Muir uh, mentioned the North-South interconnector. The parties that he's going to go through the lobbies with are the parties who have been most opposed to the North-South interconnector. I agree with him. We need to have an electricity system which is fit for purpose. People need energy. It needs to be make greater utilisation of that green energy through the North-South interconnector than is currently the case. But the parties that he'll, he'll vote with are, are actually opposed to it. And I do welcome TransLink's recent recogni recognition um, that there is quality buses available in Northern Ireland. It took them a long time to identify um, that there was, actually was buses um, uh, manufactured here. And uh, I welcome the fact that they are now um, acquiring them. Uh, but TransLink have their own uh, pieces of work to step up to. Running empty buses or empty trains is not good for the environment. And uh, I recognise that uh, public transport is something which is critical going forward. Um, but it is critical that they make the right decisions uh, with the limited funding that is available to all departments, including health and education, um, to provide for the needs of the people of Northern Ireland. Speaking of education, Ms Hunter um, raised this issue in terms of the environment. I have to say, if she checks out her facts, she will find that Northern Ireland is leading when it comes to education on environmental issues. All of our eco-schools are registered and have innovative programmes and activities um, delivering um, on issues such as Rethink Waste, uh, which um, I actually introduced um, previously. So in terms of this, there are currently strong conditions um, for the government to reinforce climate positive behaviours that have emerged during the lockdown, including increased remote walking, working, cycling and walking. And I believe that our leadership will play a key role in forming of new social norms and expectations. I can assure members that my focus as a dear minister is to find ways where we can all work together, where we can achieve those positive outcomes, uh, both for nature and for business, and tackle the challenges of climate change. So I don't support the motion. I can't support the motion. We shouldn't be using language such as emergency or crisis. Northern Ireland climate change legislation shouldn't be rushed through and forced upon the Assembly without it being properly informed and considered. We need greater clarity and evidence on what should go into legislation and what that can deliver for Northern Ireland. And without this, we have a real risk of rushing through something which we'd later find out has a detrimental effect and put up barriers for our businesses and industry, debilitating Northern Ireland's realisation of a just transition to a low, low, green, or low carbon green economy. I should say that we're leaving the European Union, and over that period that we were in the European Union, it produced 2,800 regulations and laws for agriculture alone. And what I hear from people on the other side of the chamber is more regulation. I don't want more regulation. I want more actions. And you will achieve much more by giving people leadership than bullying people into doing things. And we can give them that leadership. We can demonstrate to the public unequivocally that the actions that we take are actions that will actually be of real benefit to the environment. Bring in regulations such as a farmer having to request permission from DERA to clean out what we term in the country as a shuck did not do one bit of good for the environment. Not one bit of good, but it was another regulation. I'm not interested in waste of time regulations which are a burden to the individuals and a burden to the government to actually implement. I'm interested in actually doing real things and actually reducing the greenhouse gases uh, that we produce, reducing the carbon that we produce, looking at how we can uh, sequestrate it better, looking at how we can do things better in terms of working from home, all of those things. It is something that all of us and all of our departments uh, need to be working on together. It's something that I'm happy to give leadership upon. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. 
I now call on John Stewart to wind on the amendment, and you'll have up to five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, and allow me to wind on the amendments. Uh, can I say from the outset that I do support um, or certainly acknowledge the spirit and the intent of the original motion, but I would say that our amendment was not designed to in any way impede the intentions of that, but rather to inform what would ultimately um, form uh, the Climate Change Act and something that we as a party support. I do believe, having watched the committee, that there was no real um, insight or justification for what seemed like an arbitrary figure of three months. It was a figure plucked from the air, so equal we could have applied as to why not three weeks. I mean, where, I don't see where that figure came from, and those that argue most adamantly that it needs to be done so quickly seem to forget the fact that many prevented this house from sitting for three years, during which time this emergency has moved on. Yeah, happy to give I get an extra minute. Would you recognise? I appreciate what you're saying about the three months, and I appreciate what the minister said too. Two things: one, would he have it at a different time scale in mind? And two, does he not accept that you could bring forward a process of consultation on legislation? You could bring forward draft legislation, which would be debated in this house, and stakeholders would give their views on it. Members, an extra minute. Yeah, yeah I thank the member for, for his intervention. Yes, I do. On the time frame in mind, I think that given the, the conditions that we're in, we're in the middle of the biggest health crisis that we've ever seen. There's a lot going on with the executive and the work that's going on. A consultation that could be launched right now to be finished by the end of this year and a Climate Change Act enacted in 2021 in order to celebrate and mark the centenary of Northern Ireland and, and acknowledge the, 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 um, the work that we need to do to cherish and promote our green and pleasant land here. So, yeah, I do. I just don't think an arbitrary figure of three months that was plucked from the air is one that is any way should, should be binding at this stage. Um, climate change um, is a global crisis. Um, record breaker temperatures across the globe, including 38 degrees in, Sir in Siberia this year, with high temperatures and drought affecting food uh, production, have impacts everywhere, and Northern Ireland is not exempt. We have seen um, rising... Um, emissions here, um, air quality pollution levels high in, in terms of Belfast compared to other cities around the UK and thankfully um, due to um, some of the reduction in traffic due to COVID they have gone down but it would be worrying to see them going back up again. We also have the impact of um, coastal erosion and rising tides here so Northern Ireland will be affected. Equally changes brought about by Brexit mean that Northern Ireland will also be in a unique situation where it comes to the repatriation of powers in the EU and climate change and on the environment. And regardless of legislation in London or Brussels, we need the act. Uh, we have the opportunity to bring about real change in the transforming our economy and our environment to help mitigate against many of the worst aspects of increasing greenhouse gas emissions and making a valid contribution to uh, dealing with climate change. Um, as a party spokesperson um, on climate change, I support Northern Ireland specific legislation in the form of an all-encompassing climate change act or Northern Ireland targets on emissions on the need for an independent environmental agency. Um, uh, and including our party commitment to see and deliver zero net carbon by 2035. Um, as a result of the last storm and executive, we're the only administration in the UK and Ireland not to produce its own laws to cut carbon and to improve and protect our environment. And as a result of the hiatus of three years of absolutely nothing here, we're even further down the line. So I do find it somewhat ironic that some people bang a drum about the emergency when we could have been dealing with this in 2017, in 2018 and in 2019. Um, I'm not saying, Mr Deputy Speaker, that legislation is the panacea to all problems, and there is undoubtedly an awful lot of virtue signalling on this issue, but the impression, sadly, for too long has been given that Northern Ireland does not take the issue seriously, and that is unfortunate to say the least. I said in my maiden speech in here um, two or three months ago when speaking on the issue that what we can do here can be summed up in two words, which is mitigation and adaptation. Um, we need to mitigate again, and address the causes of climate change and adapt, meaning making the necessary changes to reduce and negate the effects of climate change, such as protecting our sea walls and improving our coastal communities against the vulnerable impacts of climate change. Neither of these can be done in a silo mentality in one department in our executive or without having a link to local governments, numerous NGOs, our businesses and every level of society. That sort of work will require a full and in-depth and up-to-date public consultation that can be carried out now ahead of getting this work done and a Climate Change Act implemented in 2021 to mark the centenary of Northern Ireland and to preserve our green and present land for many years to come. I think the time has come not to act and like I say from the start, this amendment was not in any way or shape or form to take away from the intent of the motion. And I think many people in here today have spoken um, with many things I agree with. I think we're all on the same page about identifying just how important an issue this is. But three months potentially, or as the Minister said, is far too obtuse and doesn't um, give us an opportunity to fully consult. And I think that could be done this year and enact, enacted next year. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. 
I now call on the Chairperson of the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee, Declan McAleer, to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. Uh, thank you, Les uh, for um, that. And I welcome a very, uh, a very wide-ranging and robust uh, debate here today. Um, I suppose before I go to some of the contributions that were made, I just want to pick up on a couple of things. Um, one of them is I'm glad to note that the Minister has been noted that I've been pushing the case for the health farmers because he certainly hasn't been doing it. Some of the decisions he's made here since he became Minister has been to the detriment of the health farmers. He hasn't returned the ANC payments. He's blocked the transition towards a flat rate. The £25 million pound that he allocated recently, there'll not be a penny of it going to the hills. So at least I'm here and our party's here and we're here to advocate the health farmers because the Minister for Agriculture is certainly not the Minister for Hill Farmers. And that's increasingly been seen. I'm glad he's reading the Farm Press where he's seeing me advocating the case for the Hill Farmers. But, yeah. I the member for uh, sticking up for the Hill Farmers. And the Minister made a number of accusations and assertions that weren't even included in, in my contribution. Uh, to agriculture, but I mean, it doesn't need to take my word for it. He can take the Ulster Farmers Union, who, in their own briefing paper, have said that climate change is impacting on farmers and needs addressed. They've also said that farmers in the north need to be part of the solution. That farmers in the north have signed up to tackling emissions within the greenhouse gas implementation partnership. That farmers are impacted by climate change, therefore directly aware of the challenges. And research and new technologies are needed to help industry net zero. Okay, yeah. Thank you for that intervention. Um, but I will, say, I will agree with one thing that the Minister did say, that you know, the farmers, farmers do play a huge role. They are environmental custodians. I do agree with what he's saying in terms of the sequestration uh, of the cattle and the ro important role they have in terms of the environment and uh, for the climate. Um, I don't see them as um, separate. They're the same. The farmers our, our environmental custodians. Farming can play a huge role. But climate does have a huge impact. And indeed, uh, as a representative of the Sparrows, I know the impact in the, the Glenelg area three years ago when there was a huge landslide that devastated the loss, dev devastated farming in that area. Farmers are still dealing with the loss of it. It's something that the Minister has yet to deal with as well in terms of compensating or supporting those farmers. Um, I have seen how climate has impacted those farmers in particular who were devastated. And then on top of that has come the COVID crisis, the, the loss of the ANC, and the fact that the majority of them will get nothing out of the £25 million uh, COVID scheme that the Minister set a criteria for recently, which indeed I hope that the £7 million that he has retained uh, will look at the hill farmers in another tranche. Uh, in terms of turning to the debate, uh, Phil McGuigan highlighted the concerns regarding the dangers of low warming and the lack of action is alarming, and he called for leadership and ambition, and action needs to be taken now. Uh, Rosemary Barton welcomed the opportunity for uh, renewed support for the Climate Change Act and call for a sustainable way moving forward it must be found. And we need a combined effort to reduce emissions and zero carbon for zero carbon society. And we need a consultation period for our own legislation to identify the needs and the gaps that are here. William Irwin uh, said this was an unquantifiable issue, an unquantifiable cost. He did refer to the important role of farming in relation to this as well. He doesn't support the motion, and we need to ensure the agri industry remains profitable. Uh, Carol, um, Carol Hunter of the SDLP says, we can't wait any longer, we must act now. There is growing evidence of the impact of climate change, uh, the impact that's having. She talked about also about the important role of young people and in incorporating climate change into the curriculum and that young people are leading this campaign. And the failure to take action now uh, will, lead, will have a devastating impact and that there are, um, th this is impact across the world and affecting disadvantaged uh, people more so. John Blair uh, talked about the evidence of the importance of this motion is in the spirit of protection and asked for support for the motion. And we need to act here for now. He supports the motion and he welcomed the green growth uh, strategy. Claire Bill Bailey said that this was uh, long overdue, uh, that this is a human rights issue and a health issue and it threatens our way of life and will not all be affect we will not all be affected equally. 
And there's a rare opportunity, so let's not lose uh, this. We need to think uh, post-pandemic what it'll look like, and we need to be guided by science and political will. It's a unique, unique chance. Um, Cave Archibald, uh, climate is the core of uh, new um, policies. Uh, the, the evidence exists, evidence is growing, and um, we need a, an, an act with targets. Uh, and the House called for a fair, just, and green economic recovery, and again stressed that the evidence was there. Uh, also made the point that in the course of any new legislation, plan, there would be a period of consultation to help us shape the final act that will come about. Uh, and climate action must be based on social justice, and there is evidence for action that is overwhelming. Huge potential on this island, and um, climate change does not recognise any particular boundaries or borders. Uh, Harry Harvey, uh, we made reference that we have a diverse environment. We have a wealth of uh, natural resources. We don't see, he doesn't see the need to whip, whip up a frenzy over the environment and call for positive actions on climate change. He commended DERA and made reference to the prosperity agreements and encouraging business sustainability. He said that no, uh, the North has innovation skills for green energy, um, a new energy strategy and targets, and much must be done. Much more must be done. Uh, Mark Durkin, uh, to combat the impact of climate change, we have a responsibility to act. He said that uh, in 2015, when he was a minister, there was a clear idea of how legislation should look like, and we all have a responsibility to act, and this will bring benefits to us all. Um, okay, and he made reference to the green growth strategy, uh, okay, and that there's ample opportunity to engage and plenty of evidence to move ahead with uh, a climate uh, change act for here. Uh, Andrew Moore, rep, um, uh, rapid de decarbonisation green growth will not happen without investment in infrastructure. He also made reference to the importance of broadband and um, he made, also made reference to, the fun to um, funding, uh, as well, funding that as well. And he talked about the importance of the investment in sustainable transport. We need to invest and we also need to invest in active travel. Uh, Matthew O'Toole uh, of the SDLP. Uh, said that between 1990 and 2007, the emissions here fell by 18 per cent, whereas in other regions uh, there, there was a much uh, greater drop. And he said that uh, in the south of Ireland that they have ambitious targets factored into their programme for government and legally binding targets to move them in the right direction. We can't wait any longer. That This is a backwater for too long, and he supports the motion and not the amendment. Mr. Putz, uh, the time frame is impossible to achieve. This was a ridiculous time, um, time frame. Uh, we, have, we do have a reduced uh, carbon footprint, but more needs to be done. He wants to see things that will make uh, a tangible difference, uh, but more needs to uh, his personal actions, and he wants to uh, do things that will make a change. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that you focus on that bit and was, uh, keen to or was good to hear the Minister then, you know, while he pointed out that this time frame was unachievable when he then went on to explain when we do set deadlines and we do um, uh, come up with strategies and when we do put them out, we actually exceed the targets set in them. Okay, so uh, that was the, uh, thank you for that intervention, Claire. Um, the um, ridiculous time frame, question the, the science re re regarding the impact, um, question the science about the, regarding the impact of farming on uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And he made that uh, rushed legislation could actually damage farming. And we shouldn't be rushed, and he doesn't want to get tangled up in whole webs, uh, a web of EU regulations. Yeah. Giving way, uh, would he recognise a tangible uh, effort could be made in terms of procurement, for example, that your party has responsibility for in the Department of Finance, reduce transportation costs by sourcing things locally and not source things from countries that are some of the biggest emitters of carbon and have it here locally? Could that not be an action his party could take and take now? Yeah. Um, yes, well, obviously that's uh, something. I think the, one of the, the minister himself said that any actions in terms of the climate change would be cross-cutting across departments. So, absolutely. Uh, but just again, going back to the minister, the minister uh, drew it across all the departments, which is quite right. But it's his department that must take the initiative of bringing in the Climate Act in the first place. You know, before pushing it across all of the departments. Uh, so, just to, um, I think that was the. Oh, Few more wee points left here. Uh, okay, and just in terms of the um, uh, where was it here now? You knocked me off course here, Mr. Given. <laughs> so, uh, 
<laughs> the plan, was it? So, uh, sorry, Mr. Stewart then, uh, he wound it on the amendment. He um, questioned the fact that why was this, uh, why was the three months, the three months time frame uh, picked? He does support uh, an act for here. Would the amendment draws remarks to close? The, uh, and the intention of the motion, but that was the equity, the time frame around that there. So, really, in conclusion, I want to thank you all for this here, and uh, I also commend the motion. <coughs> Members, the question is the amendment standing in the name of John Stewart and Rosemary Barton be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put again in three minutes. And can I remind you that you should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come into the chamber. Order members, would members resume their seat, please? Before I put the question, I would again remind members present that if possible, it would be preferable if we could uh, avoid a division. The question is, the amendment standing in the names of John Stewart and Rosemary Barton be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Do we have tellers? <laughs> order, members. Order. The following tellers have been appointed. Tellers for the eyes, Rosemary Barton and John Stewart. Tellers for the nose, Declan McLear and Philip McGuigan. Before the assembly divides, I want to remind you that as per standing order 112, the assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. It's important that during any division that social distancing in the chamber continues to be observed. In order to facilitate this, I would ask the following. Any member in the chamber who are not due to vote in person should consider leaving the chamber until the division has concluded. Those members who wish to vote in the lobbies on the opposite side of the chamber to which they are presently sitting should leave the chamber via the nearest door and enter the, re the relevant lobby via the rotunda. Those remaining members who are sitting closest to the lobby door should enter the lobbies first. Any member who has voted may then wish to leave the chamber until the division has concluded. However, any member who needs to vote in both lobbies should not leave the chamber. I remind members of the need to be patient at all times, follow the instructions of the lobby clerks, and to respect the need for social distancing while voting. Clear the lobbies. The assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Order members, would members resume their seat, please? Clark, please read the result. 83 members voted, 36 members voted aye, 47 members voted no. The amendment therefore falls. The amendment falls, the amendment falls, unfasten the doors. And we just take a brief pause while the other members may wish to uh, join the chamber again. Order members, the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. No. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. No. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. <laughs> 